Okay, all well, we're here with John and Laura Grant, uh, revisiting since our last conversation. So I wanted to reintroduce this awesome, inspiring duo. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hey, John, how are you? Good. Hi. Good? Hey. Well, good to chat with you all again. I know this one's been a uh, a bit of a long time in the coming. It's uh, it's amazing with your schedule of doing everything you're doing on your end, and and part of the discussion today is going to be about that how to how to manage all that uh, because you you have more than a couple of things on your plate between the two of you yeah right I mean, <laughs> keeps me busy keeps you busy good good stuff how you doing john you feeling good how you doing good, bad. good it's a little bit early right now i know i got you up on a saturday morning for this i'm sorry <laughs> okay it's good for us so what we're talking about today, um, if, if everyone um, hasn't heard, we've been looking to do a talk or a podcast uh, slash webinar on caregiver self-care. This is such an important topic. Laura, you and I have been talking about this for some time now. Uh, you've actually engaged in aspects of caregiver self-care here at Apex. Um, I've been at this 20 years. We are forever speaking with people about taking care of themselves. So we put a few posts out uh, through Facebook and Instagram, and the response was really quite overwhelming. I know I sent you the list of, of topics, Laura, and it's, it's pretty overwhelming because there's a lot of people in this boat that feel uh, they shouldn't be doing things for themselves. There's all kinds of um, emotions we'll talk about, you know, guilt and regret and things like that, always wanting to do more for the other person. But, you know, let me know if you agree with this or not, but you know, we do have to grab the oxygen mask for ourselves, correct? Right. I'm yeah. not the best at that, but I'm learning. Good, good. Yeah, it's so important. I just finished writing an article yesterday for a local paper and it was it was it started that way. You know, we're told so often to take the oxygen mask for ourselves before we can help anybody else out. You know, if the plane is going down, you have to be able to uh, breathe and think rationally if that's possible in, in, in crisis moments like that in order to take care of your loved ones, whether it be kids or someone with brain injury, dementia, et cetera. So there's lots of ways people are caregivers, whether they know it or not. You know, in, in situations like you all are going through, uh, it's pretty clear that somebody's had an injury, the caregiver accepts uh, and, and assumes a certain role that now becomes a huge part of their identity, their makeup, their daily lives, et cetera. So can you, from a caregiver perspective, I've been there from having kids, you know, and, and as a parent, you're a caregiver, but can you explain from a health caregiver standpoint, you know, what your, uh, you know, what your position is, what your role is, and, and just, you know, kind of in a nutshell, as best you can, just talk about what that's like on a daily, uh, what that's like on a daily basis. Sure. Um, for me, I think that from the beginning, um, I remember exactly when uh, he was in ICU and I remember having given, you know, the diagnosis when they really didn't know it was the unknown, right? And in that moment, I did have a breakdown, but I knew that for John to go forward, I had to be his voice, right? And that's where I kind of took it from is that I knew that I had to put myself in his shoes and think about what would he want off of the relationship that we had before the accident and thinking about, you know, just, you know, what his, what his desires would be, right. And not thinking about myself in this. So kind of going from, you know, putting myself in his shoes, my role with him is, you know, I am his voice because, you know, um, communication is the most challenging, but I, I manage daily, you know, everything from getting him up. He's 100% dependent. If it wasn't, you know, he would be in bed all day to his medications, to his appointments, to his, you know, the healthcare, to his insurance, to his, you know, everything that we shared together in the household, I take care of now. So um, that's challenging, but the more and more he heals, the more and more, I'm sure I'm going to have him doing our checking account soon, right, John? He's <laughs> awesome. now. now. Good, good. Awesome. I love it. Now, I, I want to speak to something you said there. So in you becoming his voice, do you lose your own voice? Do you lose your identity? And, and I'm sure there's ups and downs in that, but can you speak to that? Because I know people that have, have, have uh, voiced their concerns about that, that they, they, they don't feel they have their own voice anymore. Yeah, that's challenging. I think for me, having more of a voice for him gave me more confidence in my own voice. Right. Um, I feel like one of the biggest 
the biggest um, keys there is listening to yourself. You know, when you have a voice for somebody else so easily, people have influences on what you say and what you do. And you have to accept what you internally feel because you know that loved one the best. When you start following everybody else's recommendations and opinions, then you start losing yourself. Right. When you're not true to what you know is right. right. Um, so for me, if following that is key to keep myself content and can keep myself grounded and at peace. Right. And, and what can you speak to, because I'm sure this uh, has happened the vast majority of times since 2017, where most of the conversations directed towards you are about John. How's, how's, how's John doing? How's his progress? He looks so great. Um, all of this. So, you know, kind of speaking to that identity crisis that a lot of people are having, how, how would you recommend people deal with that? Because this is something we're hearing that people don't ask about me anymore. People aren't asking how I'm doing. It's always about the other person. So can, can you speak to that a bit? It's interesting because I'd rather talk about him than me. Right. Um, right. <laughs> That just might be who I am, right? Um, that's a challenging one for people. You have to step away. Um, I think it's a bigger um, aspect of having faith and surrendering and finding a connection for yourself on a deeper level to have that peace. Um, when we, we live in a world that's so much about me, 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 right. but when you let go of that, that's when you can find that peace. Um, but those that struggle with it, it's just you got to surround yourself with people that you know, hear you and, or, you know, it's not like necessarily you're asking for help and stuff, but they, they know when you need help. Right. So kind of finding a community that people see you and they know that you're struggling and know to reach out and know those times that, you know, mm -hmm. you need that extra support. Right. So to that, that leads to the, you know, the next and probably in many cases, the most significant question, because this is what will lead to burnout and ultimate failure with any sort of caregiving relationship is when do you ask for help and how do you ask for help? That is, you know, you, you have a, a small team around you. You have a, a large big picture of providers and things like that, but you know, your immediate team is quite, quite small. Some have bigger ones, some have smaller ones. Um, you know, how, how do you know when is the right time and how do you ask for help without, um, you know, feeling like you're overstepping your boundaries with your, with your loved ones, with your church groups, with anybody for that matter. Right. Well, that's, that's a tough one for me because I, like you said, I don't have a lot of close, close, like people that I can count on. Um, for me, I just, thankfully I have a mom that I can reach out and say, you know, I'm, I need a break. Um, I usually can tell when I'm exhausted, um, when I can't feel like when I wake up and I feel like I haven't had enough sleep. Um, that's kind of like one of my biggest keys when I can't keep my eyes open and it feels like I'm just getting, I guess when I start feeling like frustrated with everything and agitated with everything, I know that my brain's saying you've had enough and you need a little bit of rest for me. Getting outside is my go-to, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to get away <clears throat> for hours at a time. Sometimes just those little glimpses of getting outside and fresh air is, I feel like all you need and a little bit of breathing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's challenging to know and to have people to count on. So I, I, I sympathize with those people because it is something that other people really don't understand if they're not going through it 24 seven. Right. It is a very, very challenging thing. But again, I would just encourage finding your support system that's going to listen to you. And when remembering that how you feel and if you're, even if you're mad or angry, those feelings are okay. Cause I think a lot of times people are like, I'm not, I shouldn't feel like this. This is, this is, you know, this is um, selfish of me and stuff. It's not selfish of you. You need to go through it cause it is a grieving period. And it is also <clears throat> a time of reflection and your feelings and how your emotions react to this situation. You have to feel them. If you run from them, you're just digging them deeper and you're going to have to address them at some point. Right. And, and being we're talking about caregiver self-care and really more uh, proactive versions of this, because most of it is highly reactive. Like you said, if you wake up and you're exhausted, you can't pull yourself out of bed, you know, time to ask for help. But probably at that point, it's, it's too late, right? Uh, because it's much more reactive versus proactive. So I like what you said, just taking whatever moments you can and 
getting out in the sun, hopping on the treadmill, whatever it is in, on the in-betweens when people are taking naps or when somebody else is there. Um, but I think what happens is most people do wait to the point of exhaustion. So even if they have somebody to come in and unload them a little bit, now it's about just, you know, just cocking out, taking a nap and doing whatever rather than, and that's taking care of yourself. But again, it's very damage control oriented versus proactive. So can you speak to that about how can caregivers, particularly ones that are, are maybe not, you know, blessed with the, uh, the, the, the significant internal drive um, that someone like you may have in thrust into these situations, we will all develop drive um, okay. to persevere. But folks like you had that before this. So it just naturally helped the process where, you know, what can people do before, you know, the stuff hits the fan, so to speak, before the burnout, before the exhaustion. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the tools for healing that you support John with, I try to use for myself as well. Um, <clears throat> but also one of the biggest things that I had to learn was the moments that I step away not step away, but the moments that I don't, John's going to be okay. If we don't get to everything, if we don't do all the therapies, if we don't, you know, if I can't be perfect. And I think as a caregiver, sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves. Like we need to do this therapy. We need to do that therapy. We need to go here. We need to go there. I think sometimes less is more and realizing that they're going to be okay. And they're actually going to be better if you're better. Right. And so being proactive in yourself, finding time to do brain training, do the activities with them, not all about them. Because I find with John, when we do these activities together, like the power play, we both stand on the vibration together. It's fun because it's, it's interaction. And that is such a healing tool for our love connection as well. Um, so I think from the beginning, what I would recommend for people is stepping into, it's not I mean, yes, you're healing them, but you're also healing yourself in this new environment. So stepping in and asking, you know, how, you know, just like if they go to Apex, say, okay, can I have some hours, you know, working with you to just see how, where I am and just be proactive on that level to keep yourself. Because one thing somebody told me that I think is really important is when somebody goes through a traumatic situation like John, um, I'm internalizing, I'm going through the process just as much as he is. I might be able to cope with it differently but I am internalizing it as well. So I need to heal as well. So um, knowing that and um, being proactive on that, I think is important. Right. And that's one thing we've seen, particularly in the brain injury world, but this really can transfer to any other world, is stepping into those activities with the other individual. It's like, <clears throat> you know, as a parent, parents, you know, will complain about having to drive their kids to soccer practice every day. Well, stepping into that role and, you know, getting on the field with them and, and you know, playing, you know, that, that game with them. You might not be the coach or whatever. You certainly could be in, in many cases, but now you're getting the exercise. You're getting the social interaction, the connection, all of that. So stepping into that role could be huge, be it parenting, dementia, brain injury, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. It's actually really fun because we do like figure eights. So we sit there and count. Like before we started this, remember you asked us to count for a, a recording and that's just what we do. We do it together. And actually it's giving John more of a voice more than anything else. Right. right. Um, so we have, we've been having so much fun recently, ever since you've given me activities. They're so in line with John's right. that like even my eye gaze, <laughs> he does it, then I do it. And we both count together. And that's so, um, it's not all, I guess, I think for somebody that is in the situation, it's tough for him because he feels like it's all about him all the time, you know, and on some level, he wants it to be about me too. Right, right, good. So what about, what are some examples you talked about, uh, you know, so I know we're familiar with things that you're all doing at home, but what, what are you doing that you can interact with one another, some specific things? Right. Um, first off, um, you know, just even basic exercises like leg exercises, like I'll sit next to him and do them with him so he can see me like mirror exercising because we know the mirror um, neurons are so important. Um, we're doing the eye gaze exercises that you give us. Um, we're doing the metronome, um, the interactive metronome together. We're getting on the vibration together. We're tossing balls together. Um, just, just anything that we can even like if we're playing like cognitive games on the iPad, I try to play them too. I need them too. <laughs> you know? Don't we all? <laughs> I know, right? I can't get enough. And the lasers. I mean, 
just even taking those and take them in the car sometimes and he'll laser and then I'll maybe laser myself a little bit or, you know, anything like that. I feel like any of the tools that you guys get, not for somebody, not only for somebody that is healing, but somebody that is healthy that needs to stay healthy. Right. Good. And, and for, you know, for the listeners, there's many things that we're talking about that you may or may not be familiar with. And, you know, that's some conversation for another day. But when we're talking about lasers and interactive metronome, these are tools that we utilize in practice that can be, um, you know, that can be uh, translated into home use. And we can certainly provide information to people that are interested there. But there's also a host of, uh, you know, basic activities, you know, moving and, and eating and thinking and breathing you know, just sitting and breathing with one another, doing basic breathing exercises, things that are very accessible, free of charge, um, <clears throat> eating well together. That's another process where, you know, both people can be invested in the process and contribute to it. Uh, we all need to eat, you know, so we might as well make it a, an interactive kind of habit. Moving, you know, walking together, those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And also to um, Resimax is, is the sponsor of this episode. So uh, that's a brilliant tool as well. Very cost effective tool that people can use together at home. Uh, and you can go back to the intro and hear a little bit more about that tool. I love that. We actually are funny because we use it. We both have, you know, jaw issues and because we've been grinding a little bit. Um, but we both put them in because we have two of them. And I put mine in and he puts his in and we sit there and just like, mm. <laughs> look, cute. one time we put it in the car, I'm sure people are looking like, yeah. There's two doing in there. We've got all kinds of stories about tools that we, we give to people and they're using them either driving when they shouldn't be uh, and other places. And yeah, but yeah, yeah. the Resimax is a phenomenal tool, especially for that stress reduction, you know, bringing down the anxieties and, you know, just like certain realms of uh, neurofeedback, for example, something that we do in office, there's realms of neurofeedback now that are fairly experimental, but they're looking at doing neurofeedback on couples together, parents and children together. Uh, because they're finding certain uh, brainwave uh, similarity, similarities or parallels. And if right. one person's brainwaves are way up here and the other one's way down here, there's going to be a lot of conflict and strife and, and um, you know, kind of discord. Whereas if these people can get literally on the same wavelength uh, through certain types of training, now everything becomes easier, more proactive, more loving, more, you know, uh, just, just better, really. I need to have a podcast on that because I can say so much about that as far as healing him and the love energy. And, right. you know, I found that when we, he was even in the hospital bed, I would sit there and this is, you know, for caregivers and stuff out there. Don't forget that, that connection. Cause that person's still who they are. Right. Like for me, he couldn't talk for two years, but I would lay in bed with him at a time, like at 11 o'clock every day, I would go and lay in the hospital bed with him and he could count on that. And it was like his safety and we'd hold hands and like put our heads next to each other. And I feel like I could feel those vibrations between our two heads, right. you know, that, that energy. Um, and it was so, it, that actually grounded me as well that I could, I just stopped everything, all the do's I needed to do and right. all the all that sometimes and just do what I know that I would want in that situation. Right. Cool. And it, it is awesome too, that this day and age, 21st century, we can actually actually measure concepts like people being on the same wavelength. So that is pretty cool. Right. And you'll see just, you know, how people are much more productive in therapy one day versus the other. It's because of where their, you know, their kind of brain electrical energy is at that particular day. And we certainly see when it meets or matches with the caregivers, that's when things really explode as far as growth goes. That's awesome. We love it. <laughs> awesome. So uh, this is a big one. We have just a list, which we're not going to be able to get to all of these questions. So um, many of the listeners are going to recognize their questions either directly or indirectly. But I'm going to start going through the list a little bit here and, and just, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, gems or, or um, you know, tidbits of advice you can offer if able on some of these. This is a big one. And I know you went through, uh, this was prior to us seeing you all, but I know there was a period of, of aggression, you know, right? And when people are out in public, whether it's a child with autism or somebody who has brain injury or somebody with dementia or kids, uh, there's going to be situations that people are in where it's quote unquote, embarrassing. You know, people feel like they're, what do they do? This person's acting up and now they're getting nervous. Everybody's watching. Uh, you know, how do you stay calm in the face of this agitation or aggression, particularly in public settings? Because this can be very, you know, people do start thinking of themselves in those moments and how can they, how can they deal with that? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, for on many different levels. I, you know, I have more respect for 
people with those situations. Now I, I can honestly say before, you know, I didn't fully understand um, how the brain is, you know, you think, oh, it's just a behavioral thing, but no, it's not. It's usually a brain thing, right? Going on and misfiring. So I have a whole new respect for that. So I, I know for the people looking in that don't have a loved one like that, yeah, that was, it's tough. But honestly, you have to just let go of that because those people don't really know what's going on. And they can have their own judgments, but you know at the end of the day what what is really going on. Um, for us, uh, we were very blessed that people were very uh, compassionate about it and tried to help. I just, I tried to stay calm instead of fighting it. Like you were talking about energy, the more that he was raised up. And if I got, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh. And I started panicking, it was just going to make him more. So I just tried to stay calm and showed him love that, you know, and tried to in those situations. Um, but yeah, I, I think that if you, you just, I, I usually say, you know, we have a traumatic brain injury or something. Usually people are pretty compassionate and then they want to help out as well. Right. Um, so I, I think if you just go into it, knowing that other people have your best interest at heart um, and just realize that those that understand will understand and those that don't, then that's just, that's their own um, experiences in life. Right. Yeah. There is a lot of, um, you know, when people don't know, it's that projection of fear or worry or anxiety on their end, but you know, you hit the nail on the head and it's certainly easier said than done, but it's just not letting that get to you. Um, you know, everybody has their own issues to deal with. Um, but when people are on the spot like that, what happens is their fight or flight responses kick in. They may get embarrassed for the behavior or angry at the behavior. And what happens then, you know, they have the fight or flight response and they shut off their front brain and they, they can no longer make sound decisions. So it's a spiral after that. Uh, and this goes back to what we were just talking about, kind of, you know, wavelengths, you know, one is way up here and the other, if it stays down here, the one that's up here can start to come down and calm down a little bit, just like a parent and a child. You know, if the parent meets force with force, nothing good is going to happen. Right. Yeah. Just gets, you know, and I see that a lot, you know, nothing against the healthcare and stuff, but a lot of times in those situations, we would, I, I know one time in particular, we went to the VA and John got, this is when he was pretty agitated. There was a lot of health issues going on looking back, but um, he was very, very agitated. And I just, you know, I'm like, just stay calm. And I just stay in there and show him love and show him love and, you know, realize that he's just, you know, it's the process of healing. And so many people came in and just made more fear for him. And it was just making him go up and up. And I'm like, everyone leave the room. You know, you have to, but as a caregiver, know that it's okay to tell people to get out and to, because you know, you're with that, you're with that loved one 24 seven, pretty right. most of everyone is, and know that it's okay to tell people enough, right. you know, and yeah. That's a huge point right there. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, absolutely. Using your voice uh, yes. and particularly to diffuse a potentially volatile situation. Um, right. To that end, too, being able to maintain that level of calm is very, very difficult for people to do. You've had years to practice this. You also had years of you know, Pilates practice and other things that helped ground you a bit more effectively. So um, you know, if you could speak to, and I could speak to some basic techniques, you know, I'll talk about what we call um, tactical breathing, just a basic, right. simple intervention. If things are just starting to escalate for whatever the reason may be, you know, somebody coming in the room while you're at a doctor's visit and they're ramping up emotions, um, you know, once that person does step out of the room, it's okay. Now, what I need to do is I need to, as a caregiver, I need to go ahead and just do something to diffuse that sympathetic response or that fight or flight response that's already kicked into gear before things really get out of control. And the best way to do that is our breath. So um, tactical breathing, breathing in for four seconds, holding for four seconds, breathing out for four seconds. So in through the nose, hold, and then out. That right there is used by military, is used by uh, police, um, is used by uh, public speakers, people going into potentially aggressive, hostile, uh, you know, anxiety provoking situations. And what it does is initiates an immediate 
relaxation response to start to shut down the, the fight or flight response. So that's something that people can do right there. And then that practice over time will help you be a little bit more cool headed, level headed, uh, as opposed to just going into, um, you know, just going into fear, anxiety, worry mode. Do you have any kind of tips or tricks on your end as opposed to just, you know, trying to remain cool, level headed, but actual techniques that you might use that will help ground you if you're getting a little bit out of control? I think so. Um, one in particular, and this is, I mean, on the standpoint of health and taking care of yourself, I, I find a lot of times, you know, people that are high strong or, you know, have that higher wavelength and just feel like they get agitated really quickly and they can't find that grounded is examine kind of what is your self practice for yourself. A lot of times I see people that, you know, are high strong and then they end up going into like, let's say a fitness uh, regimen that's high intensity and high music and high. And, you know, we talked about this, like me running on the treadmill, makes me agitated, right? Sometimes it's frustrating. Right. If I go outside and I, it's more for that calming. It's finding that, you know, that balance. If you're going to go to a high intensity, let's, you know, you go in and people are yelling at you and like, or the music's really loud. That's not helping you. You're thinking your self care by working out, but you're actually keeping yourself riled up, right? right. So finding right. the balance in your self care of how to bring yourself down. So a lot more meditation. You know, for me, I sat, when he was in the hospital, child's pose was my best friend. I would just, when I would go to a yoga class, sometimes they would be like, can you get out of child's pose? I was like, no, I need to just sit there and breathe. Right. Because just sitting there and just closing my eyes and being in a position where I could just be, let everything out was like so key for me. Right, um, right. So I think finding that <clears throat> life is so much go, go, go these days that the best thing you can do as a caregiver is find something to slow you down and shut your mind down. Maybe okay. reading a book or journaling or breathing, like not necessarily going to a high intensity class and where there's so much chatter and, you know, you just not putting more overload into you. Right. So, so Metallica in a spin class before a doctor's appointment, not a good idea. <laughs> I didn't say so, right? That's you know, it. it just, because you're wounding yourself up, but I mean, there's mm. places for that. There's good, yeah. you know, good for it all, but especially in this situation, I find when there is agitation or if there is, you know, something that it seems like your world is always spinning out of control or yeah. just slow down, just yeah. find slowness and mindfulness. And I think too, you know, people understanding it's no one episode, no one game, no one anything. You know, just look at any big professional sporting event. You know, somebody's at Wimbledon playing tennis or the Super Bowl, you know, playing quarterback. That game is not won on that particular field. That game is won in all of the practice leading up to that point in time. So the better prepared somebody is before, the better they're going to be in that situation, period. It's just the way it goes. So we need to train our brain prepare our brain over time to be less reactive because if we're constantly doing it on the spot it's never going to work it's going to lead to burnout uh, there's just going to be perpetual problems with that so if i could get one thing across to the listeners at this point it's you have to practice every day for that big game yeah i gotta tell you one thing that john taught me because there's a lot of things that looking back john was my grounder because i'm hyper you know and um there's one thing that he always told me <clears throat> is um you know like expectation management and also not reacting he was really good at in a situation when something happened to step away and actually observe it and i found that helped me a lot in the healthcare system when i was given information and it was like you need to make a decision right here right now um and i've had you know people that i've actually had one lady that gave me something and she said it's okay if you're mad and i'm like i'm not going to get mad right now let me sit with it and come back to you and knowing that that's okay because you know, in the health, I mean, there was a lot of times they're like, you need to make a decision right now or this or that. And sometimes know that you can take a little time for yourself to think about it and rationalize it because we are in this, when you are caring for somebody, you are in this, you know, hyper, like everything's going, going, going that sometimes stepping away and making a decision is a little bit easier yeah. and just silence, right. To hear what you need to do. Right. And that's a huge right brain exercise, being able to step back, survey, look at the big picture, look at the forest instead of the trees, because everybody gets, particularly in those moments, they get so hung up in the details that that right brain, particularly if they have a um, tendency towards anxiety, ADD, ADHD, OCD, um, the right brain isn't working at its greatest capacity to begin with. So they will get hung up in the details. They will get 
uh, you know, tend to lean more towards that um, overreact versus step back. So I really, that's, that's just great. Exercising that stepping back capacity is, is incredible. That was, that was a, that was a big one for me because, you know, you need to, especially with someone with a traumatic brain injury, there's so many components to it right. that you need to kind of, um, cause the person that's giving you the information they have, you know, they're trying to do their best out of their lens, but they don't know everything that's happening every second of the day. And you do as a caregiver. So right. look at the picture and know that your questions, you know, asking questions and thinking forward, um, right. as far as. Is this really what we need to be doing? So, yeah. Perfect. So how about this? This is something that comes up quite a bit. You know, when people are thrust into caregiver roles, there's um, significant burden to, you know, the, 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 um, the fiber of the family unit, um, the, you know, but also too from the, the financial end of things. Generally, somebody who was a breadwinner is now, um, is now not working anymore. So there's the, the financial end of things. How does one... The, and this relates incredibly um, to, you know, is, is very relevant when it comes to self-care because if people are dealing with financial challenges and struggles every day, that just adds to the stress where people can't serve that caregiver role to the best of their ability. So what can people do to deal with the, the financial burden that is thrust upon them? You've been there. Everybody's been there that is in this role. Again, even if I'll say just raising kids, it's, you know, I've been there. You're not just raising kids. You know, you're, you're taking on a lot. So what, what can people do to help kind of cushion that blow and, and handle those stressful situations so they can be a better caregiver. Mm, that's a tough one. Um, safe and, you know, safe for the future of what's going on. I, I would say like, you know, a lot of people ask how we do all the things that we're doing. Um, and honestly, it comes down to, uh, you can't put a price tag on somebody's health and well being. Um, for me currently, are you leaving me? Bye. <laughs> You gonna okay. come back, John? <laughs> He's his iPad. Um, I'll see you in a bit. Uh, for me, um, you know, I I've just put on hold a lot of things that I've wanted to do personally, as far as like, you know, there's a lot of renovations I want to do in my house. I want to do my backyard, like those kind of things. Just looking at what okay, we could get all these things in our backyard. We could do all this, but is if we're not healthy, mm -hmm. how are we going to enjoy it? So just putting health first, um, I think that's number one. And also realizing that, you know, if you believe in God and the higher being, that you know that things will be um, put in place for you, that he will provide. Um, and then also asking, there's a lot of people out there that want to help. And um, knowing that asking for help is, that's, that's, an, that's an okay thing to do. Right. And admitting that, you know, you yeah. need help. And, and that, you know, kind of lends itself towards the crowdfunding. So many people uh, we're finding just to, you know, to help people out there. Some people are, are not wanting to put themselves in those situations, but people love knowing that they're helping a good cause or a good story, so to speak. <clears throat> and the fact is, if people are willing to step outside their comfort zone and ask for help, amazing things will happen. We've seen it time and time again with patients of ours that have, have done that through, you know, GoFundMe or You Caring or any of these other websites. Um, some of them are so super saturated now that it's really hard for people to get, you know, significant amounts of income there. But we found more recently, if you can be as specific as possible on your ask, then you will generally get what it is you want help with. So people say, you know, we need a gym membership for somebody that's going to be $200. Usually they'll get that paid for if they have a piece of equipment. You know, we want a low level laser for this person to help them recover for their brain injury. Next thing you know, they have that exact amount of money in two or three weeks in that account. So, yeah, um, so and I know you all you, that you're out there is saying, you know, hey, we need this to help, you know, hopefully as we all work through this and bring awareness, hopefully the healthcare will help more. But right. until then, <laughs> I think um, people are finding that, you know, these things are working. And then um, the more people know about these, the more they become available. Right. And also, too, like you said, just, you know, foregoing certain expenses, you know, um, foregoing certain wants 
and then focusing on the needs uh, yes. you know, because obviously that latte every day is 150 bucks at the end of the month or something like right. that. So you look at the savings over the course of the year, what you could do with that. Um, so I think it's prioritizing um, or organization, all of that. So I appreciate your, your tips there. Yeah, that's, that's a huge thing. And um, that's, I get that from my dad, the engineer, um, his brain makes me, that's you know, it. <laughs> that left brain. I know. Thanks. <laughs> All right. How about this one? This is a uh, this is one that came up in in different ways, but came up recurrently from the uh, from what the public was asking on us. How do I deal with my own emotional trauma suffered as a result of you know what you're going through, what somebody else is going through? Because naturally, the caregiver is dealt a significant emotional blow with whatever it is, even again, if it's parenting, because you go through this incredible trauma that your brain can't even remember years later because you were just in survival mode for so long. So um, how do you deal with the, um, the emotional trauma? Number one is not running from it and also being okay feeling it. Because I find that if you run from it and say, oh, I'm fine, oh, you know, and just tuck it down deeper, at some point it's gonna come up, right? right? So that's, that's number one is it's okay for whatever you feel. Feel it, sit in it. And the other thing for me, my biggest thing that has helped me is talk therapy is not the answer for me. I mean, yes, I love to talk as we all know, but talking back through and trying to rationalize and make logic of it. And sometimes I just put myself back into spiraling back into it. For me, working on more of a trauma level in the brain of processing things that haven't really fully been processed, going into the neurological part of it and learning how the brain handles and what the responses are in the body is key. Uh, you know, with the eye gaze and just kind of retraining those deeper level on the cellular level I think has really helped me more than anything because then I'm able to process things and I'm able to, you know, I feel like when my brain was chaotic, you could see it, you know, my eyes couldn't focus, my eyes couldn't go, they couldn't process things, I couldn't, so everything that was coming in, every emotion, I, I couldn't feel it. Um, so that, so for me, I find like we're doing the neuroemotional technique, um, a lot of energy healing, and when I say energy healing, that's more just looking on a bigger picture of positivity, of moving forward and surrendering and letting go, and understanding that energy in life, you know, where we are all part of, you know, we all have energy and just kind of looking at things as like, I can't control everything, you know, letting go of control is huge because yeah. that's coming from fear. Okay. Um, so I know I'm going in a circle with that. It's not really, but I really think taking care of your own brain is going to help on so many levels with dealing with the trauma. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, so glad that you came to that awareness where you really started to deal with your, you know, underlying neurological underpinnings, if you will, because just like right. a brain injury, if somebody has pre-existing problems with attention, focus, impulse control, obsessive, um, you know, thoughts, compulsive behaviors, the brain injury just makes that worse. Um, right. So essentially your brain has suffered a brain injury as a result of all this because of the psychological trauma, the cellular processes that occur, um, which really just ramps up, you know, pre-existing challenges you may have had. Um, and this is really important for caregivers to understand that, yes, exercise, breathing, all of this is really important, but there's um, a certain value for those that are able to, uh, you know, really engage in this uh, correction of faulty eye movements, correction of certain, um, you know, motor timing imbalances, balance in vestibular functions, uh, even, you know, postural muscle uh, discrepancies, you know, hemispheric imbalances, these things that can be looked at by trained individuals, typically in the functional neurology world, and um, oftentimes can be relatively quick fixes, so to speak, to really help that person along their path. Um, because they may have, you know, barriers to improvement in this emotional distress because of underlying neurological organization uh, challenges or struggles. So that's great. And I think this um, this goes into um, a part about. Um, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. So sorry. Um, it's Saturday morning. <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, what was that part that I was going into? Oh, immune system. The yeah. immune immunity um especially i find for myself i've i've had more colds than i've ever had in the past 
not recently colds, but I mean allergies and just understanding how that so much played with our stress levels. And um, when I started doing the stuff with you, I mean, like my nasal stuff has cleared up and I'm, I, I feel like my body's in a, can fight it before right. I just felt like, you know, when I was in the hospital setting, mm -hmm. I felt like every time I touched something, it was like I was getting sick. And that was just, my body was tired. My body was exhausted. And I, I, I've seen a lot of times that people get sick, like really sick. Yeah. And the last thing we need is for me to be sick because I, if I'm sick, I can't take care of John, right? right. Um, so understanding that's all parallel to what we're saying about the eyes and the function of the brain, um, yeah. it all intertwines. Absolutely. And, and you really hit the nail on the head dealing with the neurological component because, you know, neuroimmunology, neuroimmunity, there's absolute connections between the brain, the immune system, the gut, et cetera. Uh, but it's not as simple as just taking a supplement to make your immune system better. You have to look at this from a neurological perspective, decreasing stressors <clears throat> on the system. Um, and then, yes, all that other stuff can be effective. Look at what we're going through now with this, you know, the, the COVID-19 coronavirus, the fear and worry around this. And it's not that this shouldn't be taken seriously. It very well should. But the fear and worry around this virus is far more damaging, in my humble opinion, than the actual virus itself, because it's weakening people's immune systems. There's research, there's studies that show, <clears throat> you know, negative emotions like that will decrease antibody production, will decrease uh, certain types of, uh, you know, white blood cells. And then, you know, the more positive aspect, the gratitude, thankfulness, things like that will actually elevate those things. So we really need to reframe the mind on a solid neurological foundation by addressing some of these, you know, hemispheric or neurological imbalances. Yeah. Right. It's so important. And even on the level of, you know, as John was healing, the keeping negativity away and trying to stay positive in my own self and, <clears throat> you know, being thankful each day he's alive and, you know, each little step in recovery is a step forward and knowing that there's no quick fix in life in any direction. There's nothing in life that is quick fix. And it's through right. that journey and the hard <laughs> we grow as a person as yeah. well. Um, and so a lot of these themes keep coming back again, all the practice before the big game, so to speak. It's, it's, you know, lifetime process. There's no one thing, one technique, one trick that's going to make somebody better at something. It's just not going to happen. I do think though, what you spoke to, <clears throat> the more people can practice being okay with it, um, yes. or be, be okay feeling that trauma is a massive first step and that can create great change because the fact is guilt is probably the number one emotion you know i need to put my stuff aside and deal with this person but no it's you know you need to be okay feeling those things you're feeling in order to get any level of improvement but also to to, to take better care of the person that you're in fact taking care of right absolutely okay so we kind of spoke to this a little bit but where do you find your we talked about techniques, you know, the, the NET, uh, neuroemotional work that you're doing, but where do you find emotional support? I mean, clearly with John, but can you speak to that a little bit? Where do you find it? Is my faith. I mean, that's my number one, because I know that nobody on an earthly level can give me that peace and that feeling of um, love that I really need, right? Because it's burnout. A lot of people as a caregiver, you know, when people come in to help, they get burned out pretty quickly. And you're like, well, wait, I'm doing this every day. And you're not, you can't even do one day, right? right. And so there is that guilt or that like, you know, what? Like, how am I, you know, and that just brings you down. Um, <clears throat> but just knowing that everything in life is for our better being, we're all growing. No, no one day we're going to be the same person as we were the day before. And just, I, I feel like for, on a bigger level, to deal with something like this as a caregiver, you've got to check in with your heart and your soul. And it goes back to the mindfulness and finding those practices that work for you. You've got to connect deeper with yourself. You actually have to go internally right. to be okay with all this. Yeah, and I'm um, glad you spoke to that mindfulness because that's an area where people, you know, there's people that have strong faith and others that don't, particularly in the face of adversity, trauma, et cetera. A lot of people lose their faith because they say, why did this happen? Some people go further into their faith with trauma. Other people, you know, dis, dis, uh, dissociate or detach altogether from it. Uh, so I think really whatever path anybody is on at any given time, they have aspects to connect with something greater than themselves be it their faith, be it mindfulness, be it nature, be, you know, anything. Yeah. 
no, that's huge. Thank you. And I, I, one of the biggest things is um, stepping away from what was to what is. Um, that is a, I think, a key thing. Um, you know, I, I I miss that person. I wish they were like that. I want them to be fully healed. Letting go of those those thought patterns and those those continually saying those those little phrases. Yeah. Instead, say, I'm thankful they're here. Or we're healing. We're, you know, this positive, like we've talked about, it's just that positive talk in your head. It's a training. You have to train yourself to do it. Write it on the refrigerator, you know, write it by where you brush your teeth, just kind of, you can train your brain in positivity. But if you're sitting going, I miss that person, or I wish that this didn't happen, or da 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 da, you're just going to keep spiraling downward. Right. No, that's huge. And that's probably, I, I would imagine, one of the single most important takeaways from today is that not getting stuck in those old patterns, uh, because we're never the same as we were the day before, regardless of trauma or anything like that. And if we're ever expecting to get back to that place, we're only setting ourselves up for failure. Uh, and in fact, some people, you know, we see it with the addictions population all the time. You know, when people have remained sober for certain periods of time, you know, their brains are actually stronger and better than they ever were before. And we're seeing that in, in certain types of brain injury as well. Um, so they're, they're, they're going to be different. Uh, in many cases, they're going to be better. Uh, so that, you know, keeping that in mind, like you said, versus that, that self-talk that can really be defeating is critically important. I have one thing to say is, you know, as a caregiver, going back to the guilt, um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say, you know, <clears throat> I should have done this, I should have done that, or what should I be doing? What are all the things? And I, I, I tell people a lot of times, um, what you're doing in the moment is exactly what you need to be doing. And you're doing the best that you can with what you're provided right. and never beat yourself up. Cause I think that there's that constant, like, Oh, I should have done that. Or man, if I had done that at the beginning, or like, even with John, I wish I had functional neurologist in earlier. Well, yes, I do, but I can't go back and change it and know that I was doing the best with what I knew at that moment. Right. right? Sometimes, we're not going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be perfect. And there's going to be step backs and step forwards. But knowing that with the lens that you are looking through, you're doing the best that you can. Good. And I appreciate you saying that because coming from us, oftentimes people may take it as, all right, well, you know, even though they see this every day, they don't know because they haven't been through it. You know, everybody's been through their own path. But coming from you, someone who is in it every day, that is, um, it's incredible because that was the number one question that people were asking is that, am I doing... <clears throat> excuse me, am I doing the best? Am I doing enough? Are there better things out there? Those questions will come up, but yes, you are always doing the best you can in that, in that moment. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and I feel like when you open yourself and you let go and allow things to happen, that's when the other things come through. Um, so. <clears throat> cool. So I know we've got, uh, we're, we're coming up on time here in a little bit. We want to, we can certainly do it. Part two, part three, part 10. Um, <laughs> that's right. This is, and I know once this airs, we're going to have a lot more questions, right. but I think one thing that's really important is, uh, and you're, you're a master at this is how, you know, to decrease stress on the overall caregiving process to help all this other stuff we've talked about. How do you, uh, establish a daily routine or organize everything you have to do because that is by far one of the biggest if not the biggest stressors that people face is what do i do from this time in the morning till this time at night to maximize my efforts decrease my stressors um especially for somebody who may not be very organizationally driven how do you how do you how do you organize your life with with john i don't know sometimes i don't know how i do it um, <laughs> learning to say no is huge um learning that you don't have to do everything is another thing. There for a while we were going to way too many appointments in one day and it was just, it was, you know, so stepping back, sometimes less is more. And then also just kind of like focusing on the moment. What does that person need in that moment? And then what do you need in that moment, right? If you need to sit down for a second and take a breather, do that. But don't feel like you have to stay on a routine and it can't change. Be open for change through the day. I mean, we've had moments, I know that John had the biggest, one of his biggest shifts in um, <clears throat> agitation when one day we had scheduled, I think like three point, we had to go to the VA and go to somewhere else. And in that day we were, he just didn't feel good. And um, at that moment we were having a hard time going to the bathroom and stuff. And I just canceled everything. And I said, we're going to sit here in this moment and let you feel safe and comfortable because you got to remember this person is a person too. And if, even if they can't say, Hey, I don't want to do anything today, 
sometimes you need to be able to recognize that. And so we just canceled everything and stayed home. And in that moment of, it's like he felt like he was heard, that he took a leap forward, right? right? Instead of doing all the things that we, you would think that were gonna heal him right. or help him, I said, no, the best thing he needed was just to sit still at home. Yeah. And we've talked about that quite a bit. I'm glad you brought that up because it's like going to the gym. You know, you can't go to the gym for 30 days straight and expect to see gains. You have to have periods of rest and, uh, you know, reset and integration or however you want to look at it. And, you know, I have people look at me across sometimes when, when they're doing so much and I just tell them, don't do anything this weekend. And they look at me like, what? You know, why would I, I we need to be doing something all the time? It's like, no, you don't. Uh, we don't want them to get in the habit of doing nothing all the time, but there clearly needs to be uh, downtime. And, and again, just know that you're doing enough. Um, there are, you know, with apps and all kinds of things, there's a way to organize daily plans and exercises. You guys have, you know, countless things you do. And for some people, we'll just have, have them list the days of the week on a whiteboard and all the exercises and just start checking things off. Yes. And <clears throat> that's, you know, for, for people that are inclined to do that kind of thing, it, it's a great organizational tip. But uh, yes, not overdoing it because um, that's what we find in many cases where people are doing way, way too much. I feel like during the day to fit in some of these things, we just incorporate them in our daily living, you know, you know, for standing or walking. So if I go, we have to go get dressed or something, I get them up and we walk out to the chair, you know, just, it doesn't have to be okay. Now for an hour, we're going to do rehab. I just incorporate it into our daily thing. We stand up to brush our teeth, you know, so he's getting weight bearing there, you know, just finding it in those kind of ways, um, making patterns. Like first thing when we get up, we go downstairs and we do our eye movements to start our day. It takes us two minutes. We just, that's what we do. Um, and then we brush our teeth and then we hum or something, you know, just in our acting through the day like that, rather than feeling like it has to be three hours straight of therapy. Right. And then we're done for the day. And then you're worn yourself out. Right. Right. Good. Okay. Um, like I said, we could just, um, you know, I'm just going to ask you one question and, and I know, I think I know the answer or at least, you know, one of two things, what drives you to keep going? Um, knowing that my purpose on earth and how I, John and I were brought together for this bigger purpose. And our purpose is to help educate others and bring awareness and hope. And that, um, the story is much bigger than us. That's what drives me. Right. Yeah. And his love, you know, we just, we have this connection that I know he would do this for me. I'm not sure if he would do everything I would do. He's amazing. <laughs> we don't think the same as women. If we could get him off the iPad. No. I know. <laughs> Hey, he's, just, he's just ready to go do things. That's the thing. He's ready to go walk, kick the ball. Uh, but I mean, I four, seven. Oh, gosh, yes. But he is getting better at resting some. Uh, uh, but I think that's, that's the number one. And um, knowing, not necessarily saying, forgetting about myself, but realizing that it's not all about me, right? Right. And that life is not all about me, that I'm here for a bigger purpose and following my gifts, following my, um, my drive and my gut feeling of what I need to share. Um, yeah, that, that plays a big role and keep going forward. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it clearly comes through in how you share your story. Um, you know, what an amazing journey, but you know, you can see the meshing of the, the love, the hope, the connection, the overall bigger picture, helping others. Um, you know, I really, as many do admire you all for how um, you're going about sharing this story because it is helping so many. And um, it, it's an, un, you know, it's a resource that can be found nowhere else. And, and it is again, based in the purest of um, intentions and that's what it's all about. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I've had many reach out to me and, you know, <clears throat> in the times that you're in the ER or ICU and having those videos and kind of seeing some of the darkest moments, it helps, you know, people bring to light, okay, this is kind of normal, even though it's not normal when you're there and you're like, whoa, this is, but it is normal. Everything, um, you know, it, there's a purpose to it. So. Right, right. Understood. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think you'll be happy to know we are, um, we moved into the new office, so you'll see that when you come down next. But we are, um, with all of this we've been talking about, uh, we had one room that we're calling it the garage right now because everything is just shoved in there and, and we don't know where to put it.
put it. Uh, but we're currently building it out as a, um, as a caregiver lounge. So um, what we're doing is we're going to have massage chairs in there and all kinds of stuff. Um, just, you know, the Muse, you name it, all different things for the Resimax tools for people to go in and just unplug themselves while we've got their, their people. You know, because even when people come in, the caregivers are, you know, they're with their people 24-7, every step of the way, every room. And, and we really like to develop that relationship rapport with the individuals where they, as you, begin to feel comfortable just letting us do our thing with them. And, uh, right. and there's a huge power in that, allowing them to separate. So, you know, this just came to us. We need to have a room for the, uh, the caregivers themselves just to go in and, and just kind of detach. And some people may choose to come through the whole program. If not, at least they've got a room to go to and do their thing um, while, they're, while their others are here. So, uh, I'm going to bring some stuff and we're going to in that room. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, let's see. Any, any parting thoughts? Do you have, you know, this was, you know, initially started as a kind of a brain tip podcast, you know, 365 days of the year doing something positive for your brain. But do you have one kind of brain health tip or one caregiver tip or de-stress tip or something that, you know, you do that you use that can just really just kind of help, you know, give you a state change, get you kind of prepped for that game, so to speak, when things are a little bit more on, on high alert. Um, do you have one, one kind of cool tip, tool, or trick you want to share? Tip, tool, or trick? Um, I find journaling to be really, really beneficial. Awesome. And yes. Um, and also documenting. So you can go back and see how far you've come. Mm -hmm. It's right. been very helpful for me. Because yeah. um, sometimes when you're doing it every day, you just kind of get lost in not seeing the bigger picture because it is a, usually healing that's purposeful and healing that's going to be long term. Right. It takes time. Yeah, that's huge. I, you know, and, and, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I never thought, you know, uh, platforms like Instagram would be utilized as a, um, as a clinical resource. And the fact is we have folks coming to us all the time where we can document their, we, we can see their documented journey before we even get to know them. And that paints a clinical picture that we simply cannot get through paperwork or anything like that, or even examination. Uh, so that, is something that I'm, I'm really fully embracing now as much as I wanted to kind of distance from that, uh, really recommending to people, not that they have to put themselves out on social media, but constantly taking pictures, constantly taking video, because when you get caught up in it, it's, you know, the frog in the pot of water kind of thing. You know, if that heat turns up over time, <clears throat> the frog doesn't make it out alive. Uh, we kind of boil, you know, ourselves to death, so to speak, when we're in it all the time, when we can step back and say, wow, that's where we were six months ago or even six weeks ago that's where we can start to develop more of those positive emotions and, 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 and not feel, you know, like, like these positive thoughts and all are contrived. They're real. They're very, very real. Yeah. No, I appreciate I think the other that. Thing is, um, that. I think about as you're saying all that with the documenting is um, expectation management. Like I've talked about that John always told me the idea of, I, I want full healing. I want full healing. I hear that a whole, whole lot. I want them to be who they were or, you know, in any situation. And I think sometimes you have to let go of that, that in place. Right. And I remember when Dr. Daigle came along and I, he asked me like the goals for John and all I said was his quality of life. Yep. That's really, yep. and taking, we all want, when somebody happens like this, you want them to fully heal, but sometimes we've got to step back and say, you know, they're perfect like they are right here and right now. And that energy of telling somebody and giving them that acceptance right. and letting, they're going to sense the energy of the caregiver. If the caregiver, all they want is for them to be who they were, that right. caregiver, I mean, that, that loved one's going to feel that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And, and yeah. that goes to two, you know, raising, raising children. Um, you know, do we ever expect we're going to have, you know, a 20 year old be the same two year old that we remember? No, you know, because there's so much growth and expectation and all of that. But if we constantly want them to be a certain way, then they will not grow. They will not excel. They will not achieve. Uh, we're clearly seeing that in, in, in some aspects of the, you know, the psychological literature and, and parenting techniques. Uh, but yeah, you know, people are in general, uh, can be much more effective, better, et cetera, you know, after even profound brain injuries. Uh, we had a perfect example. We had a fellow come in, uh, was always very kind of angry and cynical. And the family had said to us, 
you know, the silver lining in all of this is he is just the happiest, most loving, caring person, person on the planet after this injury. And um, it's not saying he's better than he was before, but what happens now, they are a much closer family now as a result, not just because of the injury, but because of the whole change in his demeanor, his attitude. So right. technically speaking, things are much better for them. Right. So yeah, I appreciate yeah, you sharing that. You just kind of take it in that kind of way. There's sometimes it can, tragedy or suffering can bring you further apart or closer together. That's it. Um, that's it. There's always a lesson in everything. We're just, we're trying to grow for a better being. Right. And that's the journey of life. Awesome. Well, awesome. I appreciate you. And I know people are going to get a lot out of this recording here and I'm sure we'll have more questions to boot once we, once we get this out there shortly. Um, any, any parting thoughts? Any parting thoughts? Everyone just breathe. We're going to get through this virus. I promise you. <laughs> yes. Yes, we will. Right. And then six months, we're going to wonder what happened. Why, why did all this happen? Right. Yeah. It's and we have to, you know, maintain caution. It's, it's, it's an interesting time we're in, but uh, yeah, fear and worry will not conquer this. Right. Yeah. And just, just know that everything hey John, happens for a reason. Right? Hey John, you got any, any thoughts? What any parting think? thoughts? He's like, I'm playing my game. I, or he's looking up motorcycles. He really wants a motorcycle. Oh, that's it. Awesome. Awesome. Me too. I used to ride all the time. All <laughs> right. But maybe like on a, um, somebody told me I should get a motorcycle at home and put it in the house so you can just sit on it. I'm that's like, okay, that's a, that's a cheap, um, tool. I'll see you soon, John. Okay. I'll see you in April. Say, All right, yeah. Brother. Show him with the left hand. Give him a thumbs up. Yeah. All right, yes. brother. Thank well, so good much. chatting with y'all. We'll talk soon. And uh, yeah, take care. Have a great weekend. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.